of Package Design Magazine, I speak with some of the most brilliant thought leaders in the design, branding, and marketing of consumer packaged goods. Through the generous support of our sponsors, we bring these experiences to you. This video series explores what inspires these thought leaders and their insights on the collaborative design process as a strategic business competence. I'm Linda Casey, and this is Package Design Matters. Bush in St. Louis, and we're talking to the newly promoted Valerie Truthman, Vice President of Innovation. Congratulations on the new role. Thank you. It's still a little bit unbelievable. I've been actually doing innovation, as you and I were talking about earlier, since 2008 here at Anheuser Busch, but it's both an honor and a little bit surreal still for me to kind of be in charge of the whole mothership here in the U.S. <laughs> That's awesome. And you've been working on the global team as well because you had a global meeting not too long ago. We were talking about the beer all over the world and, and kind of the innovation that happens all over internationally as far as Anheuser-Busch. Absolutely. So I think one of the great evolutions from working here 2007 to 2008 before we were acquired by InBev um, is that we now have access to global scale, right? And that's both people as well as resources and markets and consumer insights. And so one of the big things every year now is we get together as a global innovation community. We kind of really level set on what's going on in different people's markets because obviously there's different markets with different kind of lead indicators. There's markets like, you know, over in Asia we were talking about very yes. design centric, great inspiration. Um, just a ton of products coming to market all the time. And then there's some of the markets that are more mature, like Europe, mm -hmm. right? Where we try to understand when markets fully mature in beer, what do they look like, feel like, taste like, right? So it's really great to have that global community to be able to tap into so that we can stay ahead and kind of on trend with where consumers are today and where we think they're going. The consumer world was once static. We then came to understand the role of a brand. In turn, the world has changed. With the foundation of observations, insights, strategy, collaboration and extraordinary ideas, design serves as the conduit for a brand. Without design, what purposes do these efforts serve? And what I see as an outsider is that all that kind of collaboration, I see that the I see kind of vestiges of that because your consumer base is evolving and you're doing it so well. You're able to really reach out to these consumers seeking a premium beverage experience and also keep your core consumer base happy and excited about Budweiser. Exactly. So I, I think you know the way that we look at innovation is kind of two different ways. I mean, one is obviously controlling that entire consumer experience through design, not just graphics. So how does the consumer interact with the product actually at shelf? We just had an enormous foundational study here in the US to really understand the shopper in their environment, going along with people, understanding how they actually shop the shelf. What's exciting for us is it's almost as fun for consumers to shop beer as it is for them to shop for other luxury items, like for women's shoes or things like that. Beer is an affordable luxury. Right, but it's more of an everyday purchase that you can really engage consumers with and make sure that you're delivering great experiences. And I think one of the ways we've done that here in the US just recently is this is actually a great example of a global, what we call steel with pride, right? <laughs> so uh, this is actually a bottle, this uniquely shaped bottle for Bud Light Lime. Bud Light Lime launched um, actually quite a few years ago now, right, mm -hmm. back in 2007. It was a huge, one of the most successful launches Bud Light, uh, that Anheuser-Busch had ever had. 
And what happened with the brand is it started to slowly decline, right? This was an innovative segment in the, in the year it came out. And then the brand started to lose a little bit of steam as a lot of new flavored things entered the market. And to be honest, what we realized is that we really hadn't done enough to keep this brand relevant. And so what we did is we looked out in the global community and we said, you know, if we really want to add and bring the brand story to life in the hands of consumers on the shelf and when they're actually engaging it, what might we do? And Bud Light Lime has always been centered around the idea of a twist of lime. So the Bud Light you know and love with a twist of lime flavor that makes it feel fresh and like a great flavorful change of pace. And so there was this bottle, which actually existed in Brazil under a brand called Skull Beats that we looked at it actually, uh, that brand had actually drawn inspiration from Bud Light Platinum and using blue glass, but they had done the add on of borrowing the blue glass from the United States mm -hmm. and adding a really neat structure. So what we did is we stole back with pride, <laughs> right? An idea from them and said, that's an amazing bottle. And obviously using that global scale, we still had to make investment mm -hmm. here in the US. But again, that investment to deliver the brand equity is something that we already had some experience with as a company to deliver kind of the brand equity and that premium premium experience to the Bud Light Lime consumer. And you know, we were able to turn around the decline in the brand. We've been growing for the first time in two years since this came out earlier this um, spring. And so we're super excited about that ability to kind of leverage our global scale to keep our brands both appealing to the mass consumer, but in a more premium way, maintaining the ability to charge more. At the start of a project where it's a blank piece of paper and the problem seems a pretty challenging one, how do we get inspired is, I think, a really useful question to get something from an idea or a concept all the way into manufacture. It is a team process, it's a very collaborative process. It's really about the collective and that is the powerful piece. One person with one idea plus one person with another idea is potentially three and beyond really good ideas. We're delighted uh, to have our name attached to such an incredible list of contributors. And before the camera started rolling, you had shared that the not only had the decline been reversed, it wasn't equal. It wasn't like a single digit decline and a single digit like growth. It's like you actually are double digits of growth with this brand. Yes, so you know we were in single digit decline and, and closing in on double digit decline in some different points in the history and, and now we're up very close to double digit growth for the brand. So, you know, there's some things we've done where you do it just for uh -huh. equity's sake, right? Some of the things like metallic board um, on some of our newer products, just making sure we maintain and we build the consumer willingness to pay, right? And, and build those things in from the get go. And then there's things we do that don't always pay off. So something, you know, like the, you know, the one for one of things like the Budweiser made in America. Um, that we just did beautiful graphic design, right? Mm -hmm. Really reinforcing the equity of that brand. You know, what it pays off in there is just the retail execution. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, it gets this great execution. It reminds people what they love about the Budweiser brand, but it doesn't always drive huge growth, right? In comparison, uh, you know, and in compilation, there's a cumulative efforts of marketing plans coming together with packaging, driving, uh, you know, return to growth for even a brand like Budweiser, very much so slowing that decline. But the turnaround we've seen with Bud Light Lime, I think it's encouraged us to really be a lot more bold about how we think about design, specifically design on primary, right? So you've probably seen in the press, we're, we're making an enormous amount of investment mm -hmm. in packaging as a company, right? One, over $1.5 billion um, in the coming years to put against packaging. And that's really us realizing that, you know, to win in packaging in the future, uh, we're going to have to be even bolder than we've been before, and it's a huge piece of what's connecting brands with consumers today. So it's, it's exciting for us to see you know, the proof points as we start down that journey of the ability of packaging, not just to do the marketing fluffy, feel good, you know, mm -hmm. you feel better about yourself as a brand manager if you love the look of your brand on the shelf, um, but the idea that really using consumer insight and consumer experience mm -hmm. as a guide, we can really keep our brands growing and healthy. We live in a fast-changing digital world. Dynamic communication and social expression influence just about everything we do. Business is digital, 
Impact is instant. Brands and customers interact in amazing new ways. From postage stamps to packaging and billboards, HP's graphic solutions business is leading these transformations, creating innovative digital print technologies that enable more effective, engaging communication between brands and end users. So a lot of the innovators that we have in our group, um, whether that's on the technical side, honestly, or even on the commercial side, are people who understand how to bring the art and the science together. Yeah. And that's a huge piece of what we do, is making sure that we're able to identify solutions, uh -huh. you know, a consumer demand, a consumer want, a consumer experience, and marrying that up with the technical capability, yes. right? I think um, as an organization, what we realized, and it's always good, right? They always talk about if uh -huh. Coke says if there wasn't a Pepsi, we would wish there was one, right? Or Pepsi yes. says the same thing about Coke. It makes everybody raise their game. And I think in the last few years, Yes, beer has become much more um, competitive, right? There's a lot of new entrants in craft beer. Of course, there's always, you know, our, our major competitors in the market who we continue to kind of go back and forth with, but they push us to be better. And, and I think we learned from a lot of major competitors that we were falling behind a little bit. We were treating packaging innovation as graphics. Uh -huh. And, you know, as we saw some of those brands marrying up technical and consumer solutions with brand equity and seeing the lift and the impact they were making in the market, it really spurred us to think differently about what we were doing and, and really connecting in a 360 way. And I know you guys are kind of heroing in this uh, upcoming issue, you know, the mad decent cans, the variable printing. Again, drawing inspiration even from brands like Coca-Cola, right? Who they're using variable printing and they're using a portfolio wide with but with Coke, Coke Light, or Coke, Diet Coke here in the U.S. Um, and then you know Coke Zero and, and taking that idea and you know we did a similar thing, just trying to understand you know the Bud Light brand up for whatever. What does that mean, right? We've always been the kind of company that would look out and say, okay, who can we partner with? And uh -huh. Mad Decent is a perfect partner for this up for whatever idea, right? Wonderful. Block parties, Diplo. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we found a great partner there. And then we said, okay, to take it one step further, uh -huh. we were challenged by our CMO to say, you know, how quickly can we get amazing packaging? Because realizing this is our number one GRP. Do you believe a stronger idea can lift an entire business? or that a single insight can spark new ways to succeed. At Bemis, we believe there's always a better way to boost consumer demand, stand out on the shelf, or create a deeper brand experience. Today, we strive to see the world as you see it. And when that happens, there's no limit to where you can take your packaging or your business. Two hundred thousand of these, based on thirty-one designs using the HP Indigo um, technology, no two will be alike. Yeah. And so, finding ways to take thirty-one designs that have been turned into two hundred thousand unique, um, you know, kind of cans for consumers is a really exciting way for us to connect the brand equity and, and bring it to consumers in new and relevant ways. Yeah, definitely. And to put an exclamation point on it for our audience. I mean, this is not hyperbole when we're talking about unique. You know, oftentimes you hear unique and it's like, it's 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 not something that's truly unique. Again, like you said, every single one of these cans will be different. And so it's, it, and it ties in so well with, you know, so many things that we're seeing culturally with these consumers that, um, you know, even with, even outside of packaging and consumer goods, you know, things like headphone parties where you want to be all together, but all kind of unique having a unique experience as a community and here this is going to allow them to have a unique experience as a community yeah yeah very cool and the ability to execute on that is so important the fact that you were willing to take a chance I imagine it wasn't you know the mosaic technology isn't is, is supposedly not that hard to work with but it, it has only been done really by coca-cola there's been some other brands but the other major brand is Coca-Cola, and that was in Israel. Right. And the fact that you were able to do this, you know, bring it to the U.S., do it in a market which it wasn't in before, it wasn't in the beer market. So that's pretty amazing. No, it is, and I think it's a testament to both the tenacity and the you know vision of the company. So I think one of the mm -hmm. big things that we have is dream, dare, and deliver, right? And that's really where we try to make sure that we're dreaming big. What can we do that's different and will impact? in an enormous way because we have the resources to do that, right? People who can dream big, people who can deliver. 
and then dare, which is just really, you know, dream big, but then dare to do it really differently and boldly to make mm-hmm. a big impact. And maybe we, we, you know, we bet big and we flop and we talked about that <laughs> you know, off camera, right? Yeah. If, if you're not failing a little bit, you're not really innovating. Exactly. Uh, but exactly. so, you know, how do you do that? And then how do you deliver? And, and so the team did an amazing job, the technical team, the commercial team, um, did an amazing job kind of coming together and saying, how do we bring this really unique thing? Like you said, it's not, not only we're the first beer to do it in the US, we're the first brand to yes. do it in the US. And to be able to do that, I think it is a huge testament to the organization and all the people within it. Okay, Val, you have to tell me, I have, a, you've talked about this beautiful packaging and it's one of your favorites, but I can't pronounce the name. So how do you pronounce it? <laughs> a cool dough. Oh, cool. So I mean, something hidden or waiting to be found in Ooh, Spanish. Very cool. So it's very cool. So Oculto actually came out just earlier this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a brand that I think was a really great, you know, we talked about being a global company. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's really about the community coming together and borrowing and learning. Um, this was actually a joint effort between the global team and, and the U.S. team. So Europe had launched something similar okay. called Cubanisto in the market. Beautiful graphic design. Right, I mean, just very impactful. Yes. Um, and so, you know, we were able to look at, Cubanista was a name that doesn't work here in the US. And I think, you know, when you go beyond graphics and you go to design, it's about name, it's about graphics, it's about the tactile feel. Mm-hmm. And that's really, this brand was meant to resonate with people in the nightlife occasion, right? <laughs> so you feel a little risque, you feel like, you know, you kind of want something in that occasion, having something to play with, with your hands that has tactile feel was really important. So this is a unique bottle right, that has some curves and some things to it that consumers said, yeah, that feels nightlife, that feels exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Um, It also, you know, this is aged on tequila barrel staves, and that's part of the inspiration for this design on the neck. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So, yep, and lots of hidden little delights, right? A tactile feel on the label, back label printing for the eyes that are thermochromic, so when it's cold, you see the, the kind of what would be the whites of the eyes. When it's warm, you don't. Actually, when you drink it down, there's a hidden message, printed variable messaging, printed in yellow on the back label that you can't see when the bottle's full, but it's there as a little hidden delight for consumers. Oh my gosh. Um, whenever they actually drink the beer. So all of those things, variable crowns, lots of things that we tried to build in. Mm-hmm. Again, this was one of our first efforts to build packaging expensively. <laughs> so we got, a, we got a great charge from our CMO and he said, you should build the most expensive pack we've ever had in a six pack. If this is a premium <laughs> nightlife brand and we're looking to compete in the same moments that spirits are working, mm-hmm. we know the emotional aspect of that is really strong. Yes. So we said, don't build it when you don't have to, but if you need to build it in, do it. And so we did. And what I love about the tactile experience is it makes it makes the beer kind of a conversation breaker at yeah. the club and definitely makes you want to uh, makes you want to know more about it and definitely share it social media and things like that yeah yeah I can't tell you if you look out at you know hashtag a cool toe mm-hmm. there are so many pictures of this pack and if mm. you do remarkable innovation people remark on it yes right and so one of the things we tried to do is we were designing and Keenan Thompson at the time was was our packaging director and was a great advocate alongside our global team and our technical team of bringing some really tough innovation when we work at scale right changing out a tab is very difficult it's expensive yes. um, so it was it was a huge feat for the team to bring this to market quickly but I think it's paid dividends in the fact that people sometimes are remarking um, in social media, I tried it because of the bottle. I love the liquid, right? So what packaging can absolutely do is drive trial. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, also create that really round mm-hmm. consumer experience that brings them back. And you're doing such a great job of really tying in the consumer experience with the other parts of the merchandising and the marketing and the innovation. Yeah, no, I think it's a great uh, evolution we've made as a company with our brand teams, obviously, as very close partners, our insights teams, our technical teams as very close partners, to really understand how we bring that you know holistic experience um, to life. And just in the study we just did that I talked about, the foundational study, if you ask consumers, does packaging matter? They'll say, no, you know, it really doesn't matter. Except when, <laughs> right? <laughs> Except when I need to understand, you know, I'm coming upon something the first time and I need to understand what I think it will taste like. Except when I want to understand what the flavor of the beer will be. I want to understand what the alcohol will be. Both visually, you can communicate that through the attitude of the brand as well as, you know, more than just 4% ABV, 
right? So all of those except wins are all of the <laughs> things that we tap into, right? That we know are actually those emotional triggers. And a lot of times people, you know, consumers like to think that, you know, they're not affected by marketing. Right, but the reality is the packaging is the first moment of truth as people come upon the brand in the store, and especially for new products or even for current products that we want to drive new penetration, new trial, just you know reminding people of physical availability of the core of our portfolio, which does you know the vast uh, majority of the heavy lifting for our brand. So making sure we're putting new coats of paint on those, making sure with new brands we bring in the market, we really connect the experience. Um, those are some of the big charges for the innovation team here at Anheuser Busch. So we were talking a little bit before the camera started rolling about a change of philosophy. Absolutely, and you know I think we're looking at packaging as a vehicle not only to deliver brand equity, mm -hmm. but one of the other big focus areas of evolution in the past few years is focusing packaging on occasion, and how we open up new occasions with packaging. Um, and I think one of the examples there, and it's still, you know, this is, I, I'll be honest with you, right, and as innovator, this is still a story waiting to be told. Will this work or will this not work? <laughs> so a year from now, we can get back together and understand that piece. But, you know, looking here and saying for a sharing occasion, there's a female consumer of the Lime Marita, the Strawberry brand, who does not, you know, wants a bigger package, but doesn't want a 25 ounce can. It's an awkward package. It doesn't feel appropriate for sharing with me and girlfriends on a night out. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at it and we said, what can we do on our lines with our equipment with relatively you know, small investment to kind of test and learn and understand, can we do something that appeals and opens up the brand to the maybe the existing consumer, but in a new occasion, right? And so really looking at how do we drive occasions for Bud Light, Budweiser, you know, the Lime Marita brand, and really looking at how do we connect packaging with experience um, for consumers in that way. And it's exciting. It's opened up our eyes as we started to really dig in to all of the opportunity we have with our core portfolio as well as kind of our, our farther out. And it's interesting that, you know, this is a product developed for women in mind because when you think of the beer industry, you definitely think primarily of men. There's a lot of men in leadership roles. There's a lot of men, you know, male consumers. It's, yeah. it's really kind of um, male dominated. And so, you know, how have you been able to thrive in such a male-dominated industry? It's a great question with a lot of bumps and bruises. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's been, you know, it's good. I think one of the exciting things about the culture of Anheuser-Busch and Bob is that it is a culture, and, you know, from Brito down, mm -hmm. um, you, you'll always hear them talk about it, but it is real, right? It is mm -hmm. a culture of meritocracy. And so anyone who has great ideas, great drive, great ownership, great delivery, will continue to have a chance to impact the industry through our company. And so I think, you know, one of the burdens of, of kind of a female in the industry sort of thing is figuring out and helping people figure out the nuance of kind of the female beer consumer. And there is a female beer consumer, right? Females are still 40% of kind of overall beer volume. And we have whoa, a lot whoa. of- Females are 40% of overall beer volume? Seriously? Yep. I did not know that. Yes. So wow. there's still, you know, people think about it as being a very male dominant. And some brands are much more extreme, mm -hmm. right? But in general, that that is kind of the mantra. And, you know, I, I think the beauty of beer is that it's kind of the, the uh, social equalizer. We talk about it as the original social network, right? So it's what brings a lot of people together. Yeah. And the reality is, especially with millennials, females are kind of punching above their weight in driving alcohol choice in co-ed social situations, right? So really understanding the psyche of the female beer consumer is important. And I think one of the, you know, it's really to borrow from Under Armour, right? Which is an inspiration for me. Um, you know, it's not about pinking it and shrinking it for female consumers, right? So there are products we have that are certainly from a taste profile, what people would think about mm -hmm. as being more female. Um, but it's also about just understanding how do we connect our brands? Again, females, you know, with you hold this in your hand, for a male, it might feel very dominant. For a female, you know, what we hear is that it feels like it's made for my hand. It feels comfortable, right? I have gigantic hands. But most females have a smaller hand and being able to kind of feel mm -hmm. um, kind of the design element for some of the packaging is a very easy way for us to appeal to a different consumer without holistically changing the proposition. You know, people think about make it sweeter. There's a lot of other ways to appeal to the female kind of psyche and emotional experience. There really is no longer um, a big uh, kind of dividing line between liquid innovation and pack innovation. Here at ABI, it's just innovation, mm -hmm. right? You can't bring a new liquid to market without packaging to really bring that whole experience to life. 
And so I think, you know, kind of learning and evolving to that space has been really powerful for the company and supported by a lot of, you know, male. And also we've got a lot of kind of up and coming females who Yorn is doing a great job investing in within our marketing organization as well. So yes, that's amazing that the women are being, they're being encouraged and shepherd through if you have the talent. Yes, absolutely. Whoever has the talent, it is an equal opportunity organization for you, sure. Awesome. Have you done any, um, any work outreach with women outside of your work with Anheuser-Busch? Have you done anything, um, any charitable or nonprofit? Yeah, you know, I actually, um, through, through Washington University, which is where, here in St. Louis actually, which is where I got my undergraduate degree back in 2001 uh, as a biomedical engineer, and then actually went and got my MBA in 2000, I guess I was done in 2008. Um, you know, I really got very involved there in kind of the female piece of that organization. So specifically in business, kind of females in business is a big deal, right? Especially with the MBA, Washington University puts a lot of emphasis on a lot of women come back, get their MBA, enter the workforce, and then for, for a myriad of different reasons, end up kind of not necessarily um, keeping, keeping the same length of career as, as maybe some of their male counterparts do. So, you know, part of a lot of effort by Washington University, for sure, in helping to cultivate, um, you know, female networking within the business uh, world here in St. Louis, as well as across a lot of different areas. And so, you know, I think bringing that into um, Anheuser-Busch, there's an organization here that's all about keeping kind of the females within the group connected. And sometimes the males get a little uh, touchy whenever we have our beer conventions and there's a female you know, we have a happy hour each time. We tell them they can have their own happy hour, right? Um, but sometimes it's nice just to get other females together just yeah. as a sounding board. You know, yeah. a lot of the issues and opportunities are the same. But a lot of times it's always nice, you know, whether it's a male and male bonding mm -hmm. or female and female bonding, you know, people who sometimes, you know, just connect with others in a different way to help you see the world and feel supported. Definitely, you know, um, I think I'll back a lot to uh, David Brooks and Social Animal, and he wrote in the book that, you know, a lot of what success is, is definitely culture that we bring in as far as, you know, gender and race that we bring in, and being able to have a community and support. It's more, it's more about learning culture as well, and changing the culture yeah. as far as improving it and making it more inclusive as well as education. And so sometimes we think that the education part of it or the networking opportunities, but it's just the fact that you're getting together is actually moving everybody forward. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of the things that for sure with innovation, right? I, mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly where it came from, but one of the mantras we've always used is that in my mind, there's really no, there's no new thing to be innovated, right? Invention, yes, there's some invention, but at the end of the day, innovation is usually bringing two ideas that otherwise just haven't been connected and connecting them in a way that creates new value in the world, right? And so I think one of the things we've always tried to do in the innovation group here at Anheuser-Busch is bring people together with different backgrounds, whether that be their actual career background, whether that be their ethnicity, whether that be gender, whether that be whatever, you know, different age ranges, everybody, because everybody sees the world a little differently. Right, so you know, I obviously have an engineering background, I have teaching in my background, I have a lot of different things I've done in life. We have people who have finance, we have people who have come from agency side. So we really try to get a milling pot of people together and the AB culture is open office. So I mean, you sit right next to the guy <laughs> next to you or the gal next to you and it's all about facilitating with the group that conversation because sometimes it's, you know, in the hallway conversations, I think is more so where innovation happens than even in the focus groups, uh -huh. than even in the boardroom. It's about those small incidental combinations of people hearing and seeing different things that creates the opportunity for new ideas to flourish. And so we've been very cognizant about that effort and I think it's paid huge dividends. And going back to your biomedical engineering major and yeah. you ended up here. So, you know, talk, let's talk a little bit about cross-pollination, career growth, career directory. How did you end up here? I mean, we know how, to, it's a kind of unusual career path. Yes, my grandmother asks me this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's interesting. So I, my undergraduate degree was in biomedical engineering, um, which was a new field at the time. Very exciting, really bringing yeah. together again the art and the science within that area. Um, my husband, I got married right out of college and my husband was in the military, so I lived in Germany for two and a half years, did teaching, which is great at again rounding out that empathetic skill set 
having to relate at the age of you know 21 to a kindergartner <laughs> um, right and then to like a, a you know a freshman in high school and that sort of thing just kind of learning the skill sets and yeah. understanding how to listen uh -huh. and to hear and to empathize and to look at the world through somebody else's eyes um, which for me was was you know a nice addition to my skill set came back to the US and did biomedical engineering so I did medical device design for about two and a half years um, for a small company in Louisville, Kentucky, but we worked with Johnson & Johnson, Boston Scientific. So the idea of having complete ownership over a business in a very small company of about seven engineers, but working with enormous multinational companies and figuring out how to solve their problems and working with doctors to understand, right, how do we create something? These companies would bring things to us that had been stymied. They'd been killed by the process, killed by the machine, put on hold, and we would help them create the breakthroughs by really listening to the doctors listening to their issues and creating, you know, bringing together again, like we talked about that technical and that user experience. And so, you know, that led me to go back and get my MBA, understand I loved what I was doing, but needed to, had a passion and a curiosity behind the business side. So when I got my MBA and had the opportunity to start working here, there was just such an amazing culture, such amazing people. And, you know, I think the challenge here is enormous in that you know there's and I love there's such an enormous opportunity for all of our craft brewing partners right uh -huh. but their their opportunity and their challenge is very different than ours right they can create an amazing unique beer that sells only in their brew pub and that can be absolute success and I love that and it keeps our industry healthy and it keeps me excited uh -huh. about beer I think our challenge is about how do you create something that's a million beer Right? How do you connect in a mass but unique and meaningful and relevant way with consumers to bring big ideas to life with big investment? Um, and, and I think it's a challenge every day that my team gets super, super jazzed about. And that this nails it, right? It does. It does, <laughs> right? Gina, Gina Bazigian on our side, you know, um, the Bud Light team, everybody coming together to really challenge the team to do things new, the technical team delivering. Um, it's it's just been an amazing experience with that, with that innovation. Yes, mass and yet unique. But how does innovation work with, you know, you have to work with consumer insights, you have to work with the merchandising group. I imagine you have to work with the retailers and the retail programs. Absolutely. How does that collaboration work? <laughs> it's, it's like magic, right? It's an elegant solution, <laughs> not a simple solution. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think it's very exciting and, and it's a good point bringing up the retail partners because that's such a key part of what we do. So I think innovation can come from anywhere. And I think it's one of our realizations just lately, and again, um, working with Keenan Thompson, who came with a background from Kimberly Clark, from Colgate, especially Kimberly Clark, very shopper oriented mm -hmm. as a company, right? So he brought a new lens. And we, have a, we certainly have a very strong shopper marketing group, but within marketing, we probably haven't always had as much of a focus on that as we should have. And using retail as an inspiration in the shopper, mm -hmm. as much as the consumer, especially in packaging, is so important. And so, you know, as we've kind of evolved in that way, figuring out how do we more closely partner. So I think in some areas we'll give ourselves a, you know, a B minus <laughs> and others we've got an A plus, but I think the retail side, you know, we make the rounds. Um, my, my previous boss, Pat Magoli and I would make the rounds every year with our retail partners, uh, you know, talking to them about shelf sets and, you know, why we're bringing new things to market and really having to make that story for, it may be good for Anheuser-Busch, it may be good for the consumer, but where the consumer, the company, and the retailer all come together, that's where we make innovation magic. So I think figuring out the right way to do that within our own company, as well as external to the company, has been really a learning curve. And I'm, I, you know, I'm so thankful I've had the amount of time I've had in innovation to be able to start to learn. I still have an enormous amount to learn, <laughs> uh, but it's been a really great ride in kind of closing the gap. And every day I come in and I, I learn something different. I'm challenged by the team. Put you on the spot here. Oh man. <laughs> what one project are you the most proud of? Oh, there's so many. Um, if there was one project I'm most proud of, the one that I guess I saw through um, probably the strongest, gosh, so many for so many different reasons. Um, I think that one of them is, I, I'll say Lime Rita, and it's a choice, not, not a truth, right? Um, because there's so many I love. but. <laughs> I will say Lime Marita. So Lime Marita was something, and I'll tell you why I love Lime Marita. I love Lime Marita because one of my first projects I had in this company when I started in innovation was mm -hmm. this um, very good idea that did not have the execution behind it to our conversation earlier called Mixology. Beautiful brand, a 175 liter margarita, pina colada, hurricane, Long Island iced tea. Delicious, mm -hmm. right? Very focused on the female consumer. 
terrible idea in execution, didn't work well in our system, wasn't offering a consumer proposition that was strong enough, completely died, right? Um, but we brought back those liquids. After we failed there, we brought back those liquids in the learning and had done a margarita for uh, Margaritaville, actually. And we said, okay, here's how we'll crack margarita. Biggest cocktail in the space, how do we crack margarita? Right? We still somehow missed the mark and didn't quite open up the opportunity space. So it was a very quick um, kind of challenge from Brito on a Friday night. He called and he said, beer over ice, big idea. Have you ever seen Kieran pl Beer Plus Ice? No, I haven't. So there's this product. It's actually quite intriguing. So it, it's a big thing over um, in China which we later found out uh, why it was, but it was beer plus ice. It was a big idea. It was doing very well. And yeah, Kieran, and um, they had heard it was moving to Brazil. So they said, this is gonna come to the US. We need to figure it out. And what we later learned is we said, we tried to peel it back and say why. Before we innovate against it, let's understand the why. So we had to report back to Brito on Monday morning with prototypes in hand and what the plan would be. Oh my gosh. So what we did there is we peeled it back and we said, why? And what we found is that, you know, energy Right, so electricity outages in China was a big deal. So beer over ice is very helpful. Yes. Right, but what it opened up for us was to say, okay, what's an experience? If we want to understand how could we get people to do beer over ice, what might we do? And we looked at the experience of margarita mm -hmm. and margarita over ice, and the fact that we already had some learning there. Right, we knew we had amazing liquids that had tested very well. We just hadn't cracked the code on how to bring them to life. And one of the things we found is that packaging was one of the keys, and so the eight ounce can. Right? It's so cute. It is very cute. <laughs> um, but it's not only cute, I think, number one, it disrupted the category. Nobody looked or felt like this in what is flavored malt beverage. The other thing was what we believed would unlock the category was this idea of actually pouring it over ice and making it more like a cocktail and less like this stigmatized category as it uh -huh. existed in the supermarket today. And so, you know, the packaging is, for even for a female, right, and I know I have big hands, you can, you can hold it with yours, but it's a little bit awkward. It's an oddly small package for alcohol to be in. And so for a lot of people, they didn't want to drink out of the can, which was our purpose of making the can eight ounces, <laughs> right? So we wanted them to pour it over ice. And mm -hmm. therefore we made a package choice that said, I'm gonna be different. I'm gonna reinforce, nobody really drinks more than about eight ounces of margarita, you end up on the floor, <laughs> right? And so we said packaging can actually help drive what the, you know, the usage occasion for this brand, the ritual mm -hmm. behind how we want people to enjoy it. And so we brought together the can, the graphics, the messaging in a way that, you know, it, it surprised even us. Outside of work, what's the one thing that you are most proud of, one accomplishment? So I think that's an interesting one, and there's many there as well. I would say one for me, especially at this moment in time, we're getting ready to move to New York City, which is a big displacement, you know, and, and a big change. So I think one of the things I'm actually most personally um, proud of is a 14-year marriage to an amazing man <laughs> um, who I've been able to kind of, uh, you know, partner with all the way along the way, who continues to push me and support me and find ways to keep what I do at my job, which is very, you know, time intensive. I, I don't turn off, right? That's one of the <laughs> things I think innovators by nature are, are curious and passionate, and there is no line between work and, and uh, the rest of life, right? Yes. And he not only supports that, but he engages it and he encourages it. And what great thing is next to come? So it's a, it's a good question. We have a lot in the pipeline, right? So we have a lot to connect with consumers. I think a push toward continuing, you know, the Bud Light and the Budweiser brands really resonate with consumers and with the new generation of consumers is a huge focus for the company. Packaging will be an enormous lever to do that. And so that that is one certainly focus area, you know, penetration for those brands and extending them into new occasions through packaging will be huge. And then really looking at, you know, within beer, we're losing share, right? And so how do we continue to reinvent and grow the high-end part of our business with, with our partner, Felipe Spiegel, on that side, and making sure we're keeping those brands cool, relevant, interesting, not only liquid, but again, infusing some of that packaging knowledge that we have on our side, mm -hmm. and being inspired by what they can do at smaller scale on their side, right? And then obviously mirror beer, right? So it, it's no, uh, probably no, shock to anyone that the beer is under attack, both within beer itself, Anheuser-Busch is okay. under attack, and then also, you know, the wine and the spirits industry is obviously, you know, gaining some momentum with consumers and making sure we kind of look at what is a functional attribute 
that those brands and those products are delivering to consumers and some of that we can replicate but then what's that emotional attribute which again is where the brand and the name and the packaging really come into play so really looking at across all those battlefields how do we continue to deliver amazing consumer experiences that deliver value to their lives in a way that they continue to choose us amongst you know the vast uh, number of choices that are out there in the market well, thank you so much for your time, and I will get in touch with you in a year and see how things are going. Uh, that would be lovely.